All right, let's uh, get started. Quick poll here. Raise your hand if you have ever compiled your application to WebAssembly before. Okay, I saw a few. And r keep your hands raised up if you ever compiled WebAssembly to, uh, deploy WebAssembly to uh, production clusters on Kubernetes. Okay, I see a bit of drop off there. Not surprising. And today, I want to make a case for WebAssembly as alternative to containers, or even as a partner for containers. And we'll do this as a case study for WebAssembly and containers to run side by side. And we'll see how WebAssembly can be this uh, next groundbreaking technology. And my name is Joe. I'm a software engineer at Microsoft Azure, and I build open source software. I'm a maintainer of the CNCF container the Runwazi project, and I also maintain the SpinCube, and I'm a recognized contributor of the Bycode Alliance. You can reach out to my socials. Um, I have LinkedIn, GitHub, and X. Where are we going today? First, I want to talk about the concept of sidecar containers and their motivations and use cases. And then I will talk about WebAssembly and how it compares in contrast to containers. And then I will do it see in action, uh, running WebAssembly with sidecars, as sidecars, and I will do some future forward uh, conclusion. And in the last five minutes, we will do Q&A. All right, so sidecar containers are a old concept in Kubernetes. It was introduced in 2015 um, and the sidecar term was referred to a auxiliary container running alongside your main application in the same pod. And because they are running in the same pod, so they share the same namespaces, in particular the network namespace and C groups. And those sidecar containers, um, obviously by their name, they are lightweight and they're smaller than your main application and they're providing additional features to guide your main application, such as logging, monitoring, and networking. And in Kubernetes uh, v1.29, as a beta feature, they formally introduced sidecar containers as init containers, while you have to specify the restart policy to be always. There are some interesting sidecar use cases. There is logging, Use case, uh, if you can deploy your open telemetry collector as a sidecar container to your main application. Obviously, there is service mesh. And one more interesting use case is called Dapper, uh, which is a, another CNCF project that gives you ap runtime application APIs, such as state management, uh, service invocations, and message queues. There are some downsides to the sidecar containers, though. For one, sidecars could be heavyweight. And one example would be the Linkerd sidecar could consume up to 150 megabytes of disk space because they have bundled the entire JVM into the sidecar. For two, sidecar containers consume additional CPU, memory, and network resources because they are running as a sidecar uh, to your main application. So they're actually competing with your main application for resource consumption. There are some operational complexity given that sidecar container and the main application can be managed by different teams. They have different upgrades and version controls. And if a sidecar upgrades too frequently, it can interrupt your main application. And so all of the three points above will have a negative impact on pod scaling and cluster efficiency. Now, I want to make a case for WebAssembly as an alternative to containers. But first, I want to introduce you what WebAssembly is. It was designed originally as a compilation target for the browser. Um, it's portable. It doesn't have any assumptions on what, what type of CPU architecture it runs on. It can run on any modern hardware. Um, it has near native speed. And the reason I didn't say native speed is because WebAssembly is a virtual ISA or uh, instruction set architecture. And in order to run WebAssembly, you have to compile that to a machine code. You can do either AOT compile or uh, just-in-time comp compilation. 
WebAssembly has a sandbox mechanism, and it is proven in the spec that any runtime run two, sem two sem WebAssembly modules, they cannot access the memory of each other. Well, they have their own linear memory, and they can do whatever in their own memory, but they cannot escape their sandbox. And WebAssembly is designed to be compact because the, the very design goal was to be able to transfer WebAssembly from the server to the browser. So it has to be compact and has a very compact binary form. It is supported by many major, many major programming languages, uh, just to name a few, C++, Rust, JavaScript. And it has made no web-specific assumptions. And that makes it very attractive to run on the server side. But in order to run WebAssembly on the server, you have to teach WebAssembly how to talk to the opening systems. Enter WebAssembly system interface, or WASI. WASI is a standard set of APIs to interact with any host, and that brings WebAssembly use cases outside of the browser. It is designed with similar principles of WebAssembly, efficiency, safe, and portability. Especially it has a capability model where you just don't handle anything from the opening system to your WASI and WASI module. By default, it is given by the runtime. For example, a WASI module with WASI does not have a file system access by default. You have to grant that capability. The first public release of WASI is called WASI Preview 1 or WASI P1 in short. It has wide adoptions among languages and toolings. And in fact, Go just introduced WASI P1 target last year. WASI P2 is the next major iteration of WASI, and it is based on the component model. It was released early this year, and it has two standardized worlds or environment that your module targets to. WASI CLI, that models the CLI programs, and the WASI HTTP, that models a HTTP proxy environment. All right, so that's a brief introduction of WebAssembly. Now let's see how it compares in contrast to containers. Containers have existed for a long time, over decades, so it's production tested and people have general trust in containers. Container can run native speed and it has broad ecosystem support with standard toolings like OCI and Kubernetes. But there are some downsides to containers as well. For example, container can often be hundreds of megabytes in size. Um, sometimes they bundle the entire opening system inside of the container, so that makes it blow. And it has um, some, some slow code, up, code startup time um, that can up to a few seconds, and that's not fast enough for some use cases like bursty function workloads. And containers must be built per architecture. A container built for x86 will not be able to run on ARM. And inter-container communication has a lot of overhead. And if you go through the entire network stack, you have to do serialization, deserialization, et cetera. WebAssembly, on the other hand, has sub-millisecond code starts. And this is really attractive because now you can start a new WebAssembly instance per request. And it has fast inter communication. You can you can compose two WASM components together, and the communication will be a local function invocation. And that will present a high density for your guest applications. There are some downsides for WebAssembly as well. For example, it's not the case that any Linux binary can be compiled to WebAssembly. There are some system calls that WASM may not support. And the language toolings are not great. I've been working on integrating the Go language with WASM for quite some time, and we still don't have YZP2 for Go. And WASM is a relatively new technology, so uh, some of the security boundaries need, need to be production tested. All right, so why do we want to run WebAssembly in Kubernetes? Throughout the years I've been working on WebAssembly, I've been Hearing people saying, can we run WebAssembly in my own ex existing infrastructure? And by my infrastructure, it meant Kubernetes. So it is imperative to make WebAssembly compatible or runnable in Kubernetes. And so we have to tackle two issues. First issue is how do we distribute WebAssembly components? And the second issue is how do we actually execute them? To 
container has a de facto standard for packaging and deploying, and that's OCI registries. And we, as a community, come up with a WASM working group in the CNCF that standardized an OCI artifact format for WebAssembly so that we can use the same storage mechanism that containers use for over a decade for WebAssembly components. Now, this is a snapshot of the Web, WebAssembly OCI artifact format. In the config, you can see there is a media type of application vnd.wasm.config. And in the first layer, there is an application slash wasm. So all of the runtimes and platforms can now upload and retrieve wasm with the standardized OCI artifact format. Now, that answers the question of how to distribute WebAssembly components. The second question is how to actually execute it. Well, the naive way of doing that is you just bundle the WASM runtime and the WASM layers into a container, and you run that container in Kubernetes. Obviously, that works. But we want to do something better. We want to offload the WASM runtime into the shim process that runs in container D. And because container D is the de facto runtime for Kubernetes, if it can execute in container D, it can be orchestrated by Kubernetes. And that's exactly what we did. I'm a proud maintainer of the CNCF run WASI project, and that is a library for authoring shims that can run WebAssembly workloads. And it supports multiple WebAssembly runtimes. Wasn't time, wasn't edge, and spin, just to give a few. And it can run WebAssembly side by side with containers. How do we do that? Well, the magic lies in the shim architecture. When container D gives a TTRPC request into the shim, asking the shim to create a container and start executing a container, the container will, the shim will create a new instance, and that instance will examine the binary first few bytes to see if this is a Linux container or if this is a WASM binary. If this is a WASM binary, we use a WASM runtime baked into the shim to execute that instance. And if this is a Linux container, we just use the Linux runtime to run that container. And this is all possible due to an amazing open source project called Yuki. Uh, this is written in Rust. And we use Yuki's lib container executor to write our own WASM runtime. And we can dispatch the instance into either the Linux case or the WASM case. Now, this is a sample workload for a um, WebAssembly workload in Kubernetes. And it's just grabbed from the ContainerD shim spin repo. And it's part of the SpinCube organization. And you can define your own pod. And the only difference is you add this additional line called run class name, runtime class name. And this is wasn't time spin v2, but you can change the name depending on how you uh, de define your runtime class, which is on the right side. And in the runtime class, you define the name and the handler to a shim binary. And that handler right now is called spin. And that's getting resolved into a ContainerD config file. Um, and in the config file, you have to register, hey, this runtime spin is talking to io.continuity.spin.v2. And that gets resolved by ContainerD into the path of the spin shim binary. So that's the only requirement. You have to have a binary in the path. You have to change the config, ContainerD config. And now you deploy a runtime class, and you can use that runtime class in your pod or deployment. OK, so why do we want to run WebAssembly side by side with containers? At the beginning, I said this is a case study. I really want to see how container and WebAssembly compare and contrast. So I want to replace sidecars with WebAssembly, or I want to add sidecars as Linux containers to enhance WebAssembly use cases. So that's our three, two scenarios here. One is a dropping replacement for Linux containers because they are too heavyweight. We want to just rewrite that into WebAssembly, but we still want to use the sidecar containers to add loggings, open telemetries, etc. The second scenario is where 
you have a heavyweight Linux container. You can't just compile it to Watson because of the language toolchain issues. But you can carve out some of the features or some of the code from your Linux container and compile that into Wasm and run as a sidecar container in the same pod. And at the end of the talk, I'm going to present an additional scenario. And right now, it's just a mysterious one. Oops. All right, so let's talk about the first scenario where your main application is Wasm, and you just want to run like an Envoy proxy uh, you want to have a sidecar to manage stateful storage and caching, or you have a case where you have proprietary code that cannot be compiled to Wasm, and just run that as a sidecar. And I will do this demo with Istio. All right, so in my local lap laptop, I have a K3S cluster. I'm using the K3D to create a, a K3S cluster. K3 is basically uh, K3S in Docker. And K3S is a lightweight Kubernetes distribution. Uh, the entire binary is less than 100 megabytes, which is amazing. So I have a cluster running here. And I have a deployment called Product API. And you can see the runtime class here is wasn't time spin v2. So this is running in the spin shim. And this is my WebAssembly container. And I also have deployed Istio proxy into this pod. So I'm going to show you. And you can see that in the containers, there is my main application as Wasm, and there is an Istio proxy. Now I can just do a while loop and do the uh, cube control exit, deploy sleep, and that will sleep for one second and do a curl into my product API. I also deployed a Kiali, so we can do some visualization of the STO. And if we go back to my browser, You can see uh, you can see the traffic, logs, inbound metrics, all of the good stuff here. So this is running Linux containers side by side with Wasm modules. All right, going back to my slide. Cool. So now let's go to the scenario two. I want to do some case study of WebAssembly as sidecars and really see how. CPU, memory, and the binary sites are different. And my assumption is that because we offload the runtime into the shim, every WebAssembly container will have significantly less binary sites com compared to Linux containers. And every Wasm instance is per request, starts per request, and provides that sandbox. So there is no cost if there is no traffic. So in this case, Wasm is well suited for filtering, validating, and transformation data before requests reach the main application. I took out a sample application from Dapper. And this sample application has a Node.js application running side by side with a Dapper runtime. And what does Dapper do is it's providing a state management API. So whenever the Node.js code wants to create a new order or fetch, a new, uh, fetch an existing order, the, you will hit, hit an HTTP endpoint into the Dapper runtime, and Dapper will forward that request into whatever state store uh, it configured to. So Dapper can talk to Redis, Azure Cosmos DB, or AWS DynamoDB. My experiment is replacing the Dapper runtime, at least the state management part, with a WebAssembly module and run in a WebAssembly shim. And I want to see the CPU usage, memory usage, and the binary size. And same code on the, left, on the right side. It's the same Node.js application. It makes HTTP call into the, I call it state engine, and state engine is going to talk to Redis. All right, so here is the second demo.
This is the Node.js application. Uh, it's using Express, and it has a dapper HTTP endpoint, which is localhost 3500, and it has a state URL, which is a v1 of state of the state name, and it, ha it exposes two endpoints, uh, an order and a new order. So I have this deployment running already in my cluster, And you can see um, the node application is running as the main application, and I have a sidecar called KubeCon24, but it's my state engine uh, dapper clone implementation written in Rust, compiled to Wasm, and executing the Wasm shim. So now let's uh, do port forward. And we can do a curl of the order, um, and the order is saved in a Redis store. And we can do a new order, uh, sending the sample.json as the data into here. And if you're interested in what sample.json is, it's just order ID 42. Um, and I can get a new order, and it changed to 42. So this is to demonstrate this state engine behave similar to the Dapper engine. And now, when I distribute this Wasm binary into the OCI registry, I found out it's only one megabytes compared to Dapper engine has 54 megabytes. And that's a huge reduction in terms of the size. But in this experiment, I found no significant difference in terms of CPU and memory usage. And I think because in part, because the CPU and memory are bounded by the workload itself instead of the image. So I asked myself this question, can we do better than that? Now, WebAssembly component model is a new specification and it adds a new ABI and a wheat IDL for composing WebAssembly modules together. I think this is a game changer. It provides you high level types like string, record, variant, option, and result. And the concept of the world is central to the WASM components. It's a contract between the guest and the host. So here's the catch. With WASM components, you can literally compose them together and any HTTP handler, the, the invocation going from the stack doing serialization, deserialization can be eliminated and replaced with a function call because components allow you to compose them together. So here, the, here is an example of two components. One is my service that export an incoming handler and the other is a middleware that import an incoming handler. And you can just hook the export and import together, and you've got a composed component. And bear in mind, in YCP2, there is a difference between incoming handler and outgoing handler, and that creates some challenges for composing YZHTP components together. And that will be solved by the upcoming YZP3, which incoming handler and outgoing handler will be unified to just handler. So once you have a handler, you can truly compose multiple YZ HTTP components together, like a chain in the services. And the best thing about it is any request comes in, you don't have to do serialization, deserialization, doing, going through the network stack. You can just do local function calls, and um, that will signif significantly reduce the latency. So WebAssembly component they can be developed by many different languages, just like containers. Their communication is done by local function invocations. They are optimized for resource consumption, and they have a very clear security boundaries. Two components have their own linear memory, and they do not share the memory. They always copy by value. And they lead, ultimately, my um, assumption is they will eliminate the needs for sidecar containers. Um, just a, a note here, um, in YZP2, as I said, you can truly compose YZHP handlers. If you want to do it today, 
for YCP2, there are two great open source projects. One is SpinCube and the other is Wasm Cloud. SpinCube does this internal chaining of services, so it doesn't uh, introduce any overhead if you have two components implementing YZHDP. And the Wasm Cloud is the same thing. They use NETs and WRPC to do those low latency communication. Um, I contribute to Wasm Cloud and I maintain SpinCube. All right, so to conclude, Sidecar containers are introduced a long time ago. They're a powerful Kubernetes design pattern to allow you easily adding additional features into your main application. And WebAssembly can take advantage of Sidecars to increase adoption and reduce container sizes. And third is WebAssembly component present an opportunity to eliminate Sidecar use case entirely while retaining the advantage of the sidecar, such as the clear security boundary. And if you're interested in server-side WASM, I want to call out to my colleague Dan for his upcoming book, Server-Side WebAssembly. And you can scan this QR code to get 45% off um, with this book. And it's currently in preview. It has four chapters published. And I know Dan is working really hard to get the fifth chapter published. And in this talk, if you have any questions or raise a question, Dan is here to give you a free copy of the book. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Any questions? Free copy of the book? Yeah, um, I can answer part, and we have David here, he's the chair of the Wasm Working Group. But yeah, the, the question is, does Wasm Working Group have plans to in, integrate Wasm into the broader Kubernetes ecosystem? And the answer is yes. If you go to the Wasm Working Group charter, you will see their object, one of the ob objective is to integrate Wasm into the Kubernetes ecosystem. Did I answer your question? Okay. Yes? You said that the two containers can talk to each other natively. Can you talk more about that? Is it like going over gRPC or RPC or is the network calls or how, how is that happening that they can just kind of natively, as you said, speak from container to container there? Yeah, so in this case, the question is how do two containers talk natively to each other? And the scenario I was describing is when two containers are compiled to WebAssembly modules and you link them statically to become one component and then you can just do local function invocation. And then like in a sidecar, like, is that what you're saying? So, they, so it's like talking to the underlying WASM binary on the host or something? Or I'm, I'm just missing that part. Sorry, can you repeat your question again? Like, uh, is there, so it's a special protocol that they're talking to, right? Yes. Uh, with the, uh, yeah, so your question is, is, is there a special protocol for the communication of two Wasm yeah, components? Do, yes. So the component model defines an ABI, and, and the ABI will have a lowering and lifting. So you, you're lowering your high-level types into canonical ABI types and you do the communication there and you copy the value to another component into their linear memory and then you lift it up to high level types. So that's the protocol. It's called a canonical ABI. And we have tools like WeBangen that will generate those ABI bindings and you can just import them into your language as like libraries to consume. Okay, so they're not like talking over RPC or anything? No. That's why they're fast. Okay. Yes? So, it's a, so my understanding is that today with the model is when you do a function invocation, it... Yeah, thank you. 
Yeah, so my understanding today is that when you do a WASM invocation, it instantiates a container. Is there a plan to pack multiple functions into the same container? Let's say I have a function that is called 100 times in parallel. Could it be running as part of the same container? I guess you're really asking if we can reuse the instances. Right. Re yeah, reuse a pod instance to run multiple functions in parallel. So if I have a lot of concurrent requests, can they use the same container to run? Yeah, so when container is fetched into the local system, it's basically a bunch of files. And whenever a request comes in, like for Watson time or for spin, it creates a new instance to handle that request. And there is optimization, but it's not being done in the Wasm time, where you can reuse the instance for multiple requests. Uh, there is a plan for that. I don't think it's implemented. Okay. Thank you. Yes. My understanding with Wasm is that uh, some languages can compile natively to it, and some have to sort of bring their entire runtime with them. Have you noticed any difference in the like CPU usage and startup time of something that has to bring a whole interpreter versus something that's natively compiled? Yeah, so obviously if you have a, a language with a runtime, say Go, uh, Go has a runtime and you compile to Wasm, you obviously have to compile the runtime into Wasm as well. So the Wasm binary will have Go code and Go runtime code. And so whenever you execute this Wasm, you have to initialize the runtime first and then execute the code. There is an optimization project called Wiser that will pre-initialize the runtime. Um, and so when you're ready to execute the code, you don't have to uh, initialize the runtime again. So that will speed it up. But again, your observation is right. Wiser, W-I-S-E-R? No? OK, never. Well, I, I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> There's also a mic right here. <laughs> we got your choice now. <laughs> so I'll, I'll be the annoying person. Um, any chance for cryo support? They do have a containerd shim like compatibility layer. Uh, so you can, you can run stuff that relies on a containerd shim. Um, I just, we, we use cryo almost exclusively right now but this sounds cool. I know there's other approaches with cryo like C run and things but um, let me ask you, this, is Cryo like an alternative yeah. to Container D? Yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's just uh, another container runtime. Um, yeah, it does no, CRI. No, yeah. uh, RunWazi was specifically designed for Container D, and it uses Container D APIs for like, the task service, the sandbox APIs. Gotcha, um, so it's, it's more than just the shim APIs. Like, it, it makes additional calls back into, because Cryo does have like a shim compatibility layer, you can run like Kata containers with the container shim. But I'm, I'm guessing there's, there may be tighter integrations, so I, I figured I'd just ask. Um, uh, do you want to use? It's all open source. I feel like somebody could implement the cryo plugin for this, um, huh? but I don't think we've explored that yet. Yeah, I haven't tried it, but. Yeah, it, it may be as simple as just saying runtime type VM, call this binary. And it could just work potentially as it is. I just figured I'd ask if that had been tried or. Yeah, I might need to research into this, but I'm assuming if there is an interface for the shim APIs that is like consistent between Continuity and Cryo, then they can use the same shim. Cool, awesome, thank you. Of course. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you. And then the end, you differentiate when you would use this Wasm cloud as opposed to a spec view. The end showed that we found I was curious, how would this show up in Azure already, this functionality? Is it already being used on the serverless Azure, or how is that being used by Microsoft? So your question is about how Wasm Cloud is used in Azure. Well, I, I know how I know how it's used. But yeah. I'm just curious in your demo, you use Spin Cube. Right. And then at the end, you put. I was just wondering when you use um, Wasm Cloud and when you use Spin Cube. 
Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, so like in general, what's the difference between SpinCube and Wasm Cloud and how is Microsoft using that? Okay, so the first question is, well, this time I'm a maintainer of SpinCube, so I know obviously more about SpinCube, but both runtimes uses Wasm time as the low level runtime, so they can execute components, and any components that implements YZHTTP or YZCLI, those standardized YZ interfaces, can be executed in both runtimes. Actually, I have a demo about a Go YZHTTP application, and I do not have to change the code I can run in both Spin and run in Wasm Cloud. So I think both projects are very, um, they, they want to have guarantees on be able to execute YZ standards. Um, so the difference is, is that we have maintained a wrong continuity shame for Spin, but I don't think there is a continuity shame for Wasm Cloud. They have their own operator where you can deploy to Kubernetes and run applications on Wasm Cloud. Um, but by the way, SpinCube has their own operator and CRDs as well to simplify the workloads. So in that regard, they're very similar. Um, and Microsoft has a uh, Azure Marketplace offering for SpinCube, and that's for the open source offering. It's free. You can just go to the Azure Marketplace, search SpinCube, and you can deploy to your AKS cluster. And we don't, we don't have an offering for Wasm Cloud today. Yes? Yeah, um, I don't know too much about the debugging experience here, but there are a lot of talks regarding debugging. Like when I, like WasmCon was three days ago, and there is a talk about adding instrumentation into the Wasm modules for debugging. And so I would suggest you to check that out. It's pretty cool. Okay, that's time. Uh, I can take one last question. I was curious, you shared the state container was built with Rust and compiled to WebAssembly. Did you compare it versus like a scratch container to see if there was differences? I don't know if there is a Dapper engine on the scratch container. Um, I'm assuming it won't work. Yeah. All right, thank you everyone and have a great day.